、えー、とそれではあのお時間になりましたのであの始めさせていただければと思います、えー、今日はあのワイズの CEO のクリスト・カーマンさんをお招きしていろいろお話をお伺いするというふうなことになっていますあのここからは英語で進行させていただければと思います。So it is our great honor to have Mr. Crystal Kaman, CEO of,、uh, and co-founder of uh, uh, WISE. And WISE has been、uh, our member for some years and we're quite happy to see that they are growing、uh, in global basis. And in spite of his、uh, busy schedule, he agreed to、uh, spend some time for us. So it is a great、um, opportunity for many of us who would like to learn how WISE have、uh, developed over the years.、Uh, today's agenda is this.、Um, just from my brief introduction,、uh, we'll have a fireside chat. I will introduce the moderator later. And also,、uh, after that, we will have a QA session from the audience. So, if you, are, if you would like to ask any question, please、uh, think about it. And if you want to、uh, ask a question in Japanese,、uh, we can help you to、uh, translate. So,、um, please think about whatever you would like to ask. えー、後ほどあの、えー、Q&A を行いますけどももしあの日本語で質問されたいという方であれば日本語で聞いていただいてあの我々の方で、えー、通訳をさせていただくようにします。And we'll have a final comment and wrap up. And after that we'll have a networking. And we have prepared a quite nice、uh, drinks and the food. For today, so please enjoy until you have a time. And to start with,、uh, I would like to、uh, introduce briefly、uh, Mr. Christo Kaman. He's from Estonia, and with his uh, uh, friend from Estonia,、um, let's see, this is a bit difficult to tab、uh, tab it. Um, they've、uh, started this.、Uh, Um, fund transfer business. And originally it was called TransferWise. And they started in 2011. And it is a quite interesting story how they c o m e up with the idea and how they started their business. And if you go to their website,、um, there's a story about how、uh, Wise started. So I Encourage you to、uh, check the, the, their website. And starting from the、uh, um, uh, fund transfer business in Europe, they have expanded on a global basis. And now they have covered more than、uh, 40、uh, different currencies in more than、uh, 100 countries. And today,、uh, with uh, uh, Christo,、um, Shota-san from WILL,、uh, World Innovation Lab, will be the moderator.、Um, he's the venture capitalist, partner at WILL, and he's been、uh, making investments to a well known company like Ivan, Agulia, Asana, Auth0, Deepil, and among them,、uh, WISE is one of His uh, important um, portfolio company. And he has worked in the、uh, venture capital world for some years, but before that, he worked in、uh, Evernote. And before that,、uh, he has a background in、uh, investment banking. And of course, he has、uh, MBA from Stanford Graduate School. And、uh, also, he's a graduate from the University of Tokyo. Okay, so please,、uh, two of you, come up on the stage. And Shota san, it's all yours. All right. Hi.
Thank you very much for the kind introduction and welcome to Tokyo, Christo. Thanks, it's good to be here.、Uh, I used to come here quite often, but haven't been since COVID. So, this is kind of first time back after a long while. Great.、Um, as、uh, Shibata san mentioned, I'm a partner at Will and an investor in TransferWise, or currently called WISE, since 2017. So it's been, it's been a journey and a privilege to get to know with Crystal and the team, and a lot to unpack and learn from this、uh, amazing company. So, love to、um, touch different dimensions. But、um, to start, I want to just quote some numbers from the most recent、uh, financial earnings results, just to give everyone the idea of how the business is shaped. Um, in terms of the transfer volume、uh, for the first half of the year,、uh, WISE did 57 billion pounds of international money transfer, which is about 10 billion yen for half a year. And income、um, is 656 million British pounds, which is about 1 2 0 0 0 yen for the first half year, growing at、uh, 58% year over year. Not too shabby. Um, and adjusted EBITDA of 241 million British pounds, which is 440 million yen, growing 163%, which is at least 10x bigger than the time when I invested in WISE. So, congrats on that continued growth.、Um, but you know, every great business has a beginning. So, I'd like to start from how you started. I think some people in the audience might know this story, but I'd love to learn、um, how you got inspiration for this amazing business that you've built and how did you get to the V1 of the product.、Um, and yeah, why don't we start from there? Thank you,、uh, Tim. Very, very kind of you.、Uh, good to be here. And、uh, so, so you're, you're right.、Uh, Uh, what we do today is quite big, quite substantial. And when you add the people numbers to it, it's 10 million. I think we reported 10 million active customers now who make cross border transfers or made it in the last 12, years,、uh, 12, uh, 12 months. And there's like 5,000 people working on this product、uh, in our team. So it's quite big. And we kind of think that by now we. Have definitely changed the expectation of、um, what people expect when they, and what businesses expect when they, they do cross border transfers. In that sense, it's, it's hard to go back to the time where we started in terms of what the experience was back then.、Um, I, as, as was introduced, I'm originally from Estonia, which is a very cold country, very far up north.、Uh, but I moved to London about 15 years ago. And、uh, then I first encountered this experience of moving money from, back to, from London to my home country, which was in Estonia.、Um, and my experience, maybe I'll just talk you through how it went.、Um, as everyone would do, I would go to my bank. <clears throat> That's where my salary arrived, and instruct them to please move it to my Estonian bank in euros. And I had to fill in some forms, it took a bit of my time.、Um, that was in 2007.、Um, and then about a week later, money arrived.、Uh, what was challenging was that some money seemed to go missing. So I expected quite a bit more. I think there was 500 euros missing,、uh, so that's what, 50,000 yen?、Uh, no. Yeah, ab- ab- about that, I think, was, was missing. And、uh, I started exploring what had gone wrong. I called up my bank in the UK, they said they did everything by the book. I called back my bank in Estonia, they said everything's okay. And then I realized、uh, what I hadn't known at the time is the exchange rate that they would use. So obviously, I looked up the Exchange rate on the internet, but、um, I didn't realize that HSBC is g o n n a take that rate and then add 5% to it. So that's how they make money. So the fact that they told me it cost me 15 pounds、um, didn't mean anything because they charged me 500 pounds as part of the exchange rate. So that was really the origin of the 
problem. Now, this is how I encountered the problem first. Uh, my solution back then was to try and find a way how I could do the same thing, but not pay my bank so much. So I had a friend who did the opposite transaction. So they, his name is Tavit, uh, later my co-founder, and he was moving money from Estonia, where he was paid in euros, to London, where his living expense was. So it was a perfect match. Like he needed money in London, I needed money in Europe, and we just started making the exchange with each other, and therefore bypassing our bank. So I gave him my pounds, he gave me his euros, we looked at the real exchange rate on Bloomberg, everyone's happy. Apart from the, well, the banks don't care, but they're not getting our money. Um, and then from that on, actually, the problem was solved for ourselves. So that, you know, we didn't start, we didn't go home and say, okay, we need to start a company now. That wasn't the case at all. We were very happy going on with our jobs and lives. But then it was about three years later, we kind of um, had realized that, you know, or at least we had the hypothesis that maybe it's not the problem just for Estonian people in London. Maybe it's other people in London have the same problem or, or maybe other nationalities do. And so um, we did think we should try to build a really simple service how other people can do what we do among ourselves. So kind of match with each other, if you like. And uh, you asked me what's involved in that. Okay, so involved in that was building the software. I mean, to be honest, the first version was very straightforward. It, you know, it's a little bit more than Excel spreadsheet. It was a website. I kind of coded it in my free time during the night. I had some help from uh, friends. Um, but it was very, very basic. It's quite embarrassing how basic it was. Um, but then the important, the other important part was I, I knew that this is if I start handling or if we have a company that handles other people's money, it's a regulated business. Uh, so I kind of tried to work. I had nothing to do with, well, I had something to do with uh, financial services. I was a consult consultant for banks. Uh, but more on the tech side, and I didn't really know much about compliance. I knew that exist, like regulations exist for a good reason. So I remember um, at the time when we got started, I printed out the, uh, in the UK the regulations for handling other people's money or payment services. Uh, that, that's how it was called. And it was about that much, uh, a regulator guidebook, like JFSA guidebook. And uh, I remember for a week uh, in a uh, bike, like, like cycle training camp with my friends, uh, other people went out to drink and I was at home reading through the, what do the law say about handling other people's money? Uh, and then like we applied for, I, I read the laws, kind of thought I understand how it works, uh, wrote the business plan for the regulator, filled in the application and then submitted it and then nothing happened for three months and then I started calling did you receive my application what's going on and then you know after a few calls they say oh yeah 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 well give us time so I think a year later we got a, our license and started uh, started work we were <laughs> we didn't know what to expect so we basically put it live with a blog post on TechCrunch there was a pretty popular website back in the day and 15 minutes later, you know, someone sent us 2,000 pounds to be sent to France. So that was pretty cool. Like, we didn't, we didn't know anyone would do that. And uh, then a little bit later, there was some money arriving from Germany to go to the UK. And, and by the end of the day, we had a book of, I think, 20, 30 transfers that we actually had to make. We <laughs> weren't sure whether that was going to be the case. Um, so that's, that's that. That was the first day in beginning of 2011. And as you say now, in the first half of the year, from that first 2,000 pounds, we've moved about like 57 billion in, in the first six months. So turns out it's a problem for a lot more people than just, just us. Wow. I mean, clearly you have done something right to get there, but, um, you know, along the way, um, you've expanded the product portfolio. Um, so 
starting from money transfer in Europe mostly to other routes, including in Japan eventually. So there's many dimensions of the product growth that you have invested and achieved. So um, tell us a little bit about how, so how do you describe your product portfolio today? And maybe start talking a little bit about how you kind of got there, yeah. how you thought about the expansion sequence and investments. Sure. Um, and this is actually, it's, it's actually quite easy when you follow what customers ask. And in product building, it's usually something that uh, has to be taken with a pinch of salt because if you end up building what people ask you to build, you usually build a monster. So be also careful with that advice. But when we look back on how we expanded, it's very much driven about how we, like what our customers told us or what did the willing customers uh, ask us. So indeed we were there just serving UK and Europe and realized that we should expand. And then where should we expand? Should we open Japan or should we open Australia or should we open Canada? Like, what, where, what, what do we go next? Uh, and we basically had this uh, little trick that we asked, like people could select a currency, like they could select any currency. And for some currencies, we just told them that we're not there yet. But what it gave us was a, a list of wishes. So how many people selected a currency that we didn't yet support uh, or tried to use us from a country that we you know, didn't have licenses to operate yet. So we really, for the next 10 years, had this big spreadsheet of wishes. And then we, were, we, had a, we, we set up a team who would go into the next country, do what I did, read through the laws and regulations first, figure out who's the regulator that regulates us, and then you know, set, it, set us up so that we can serve the customers there. Um, and, and that has kind of gotten us to the, to the stage today where, uh, in terms of the developed world, we're operating almost everywhere other than China and a, a couple of other economies. Um, but you asked me actually a different question of how did we expand the product or what people can do with WISE. And today when you look at what we do, you see uh, there's a multi-currency account. You see that people will hold money. Some will get uh, use it for invoicing. Some use it for travel. Um, Others use kind of hold money in wise to earn interest or even uh, put it on the stock market. It's not really a super app, but there's kind of a lot of things we now do or support. And then we support businesses, but we also support banks. Um, so kind of looking at it from the outside and uh, as VC it kind of looks a bit messy, <laughs> uh, but there's always a story to this and, and ours was again, driven by customers. So what did they want us to do? We solved the how do you send money from A to B, but then businesses who are invoicing abroad. So if you're a Japanese business and you charge your customers in the US, you know, you give them your Japanese account number and guess what? So either the US bank converts this, the, your, your customer's money into yen and takes a cut, and it's not a small cut, or your receiving bank who receives the dollar converts that into yen and takes a cut, and it's not a small cut. So businesses were really, okay, that's cool. We've solved how do we pay other people, but how do we get paid without the bank taking a cut? And that's how we uh, uh, found a way that, okay, we will give our customers local account numbers in the US or in Australia or in the UK or like wherever they're invoicing their customers. And so that they can, you know, invoice them in their local currency. So um, invoice your American customers in dollars rather than yens. This was awesome, like a lot of businesses loved that. But it also meant that like, we need to store these dollars somewhere. We need to create this multi-currency account. And again, it's almost as a side effect, you know, we now hold, uh, you can do the math, and it's about 10 billion um, UK pounds worth of different currencies on these accounts. Um, so it's the size of a like, small bank almost, um, but it's all as a side effect. And then of course, once you have these 
uh, multi-currency accounts, then uh, people were paying contractors from there, but they also had expenses that they could only pay with a card or a credit card. And so what do we do? We, we create this clever card. It's, you know, we started issuing those five years ago. Uh, it's a debit card, but it's a, it's a bit clever because when I'm in here, and I use it in, uh, in Starbucks below, it uses my yen balance. So if I have yen on my account, it uses yens. And if I go to the US, it uses my US dollar balance. Or if I'm in the UK, it uses my pound balance. It kind of chooses what's the right balance to use. So again, that, to avoid conversions of currency. So that's the um, kind of the journey that um, you asked how, how did we end up with this mess, basically, <laughs> of different financial services. And we didn't like wake up one day and wanted to build a super app. Definitely not. It was bit by bit what customers asked us to do to support their international life. And then you know, we added those things that seemed to make sense together and what we kind of turned out to be pretty good at. I think when we invested back in the summer of 2017, I think you still only have pretty much, I mean, you might have had borderless, which kind of turned into wise yeah. account. Yeah but mostly transfer business, pretty much. Yeah. So I think it's just, and mostly for B2C, I think. But today, I think B2B transfer is getting bigger, growing faster. So like, I think it's really like six years, last six years, while we kind of invested, things almost appear to accelerate it in terms of new launches and the product maturity kind of got better, which, you know, it's not always easy, right? Like as you get bigger, sometimes you get slower and all that. So just curious, um, what makes you kind of continue to build and ship? Like what, what matters internally to make that happen? And we've definitely also grown pickier, as in we know that if we're gonna, so if we think of the, the new things we did, maybe this account was one, but we know if we're going to be issuing cards, it's not just like a, it's not worth doing as a MVP or MVP is the minimum viable product concept that kind of the tech people really, really like. When we start off though, if we're going to start issuing cards, we're probably going to be issuing 100 million cards at some point. So we better build it like really well and invest properly behind it. Um, and it's been like cars, for example, has been a fun exercise because until we started doing this, uh, you know, banks are usually very domestic in, in how they do things. They might have the same brand across different countries, but they're very independent locally. So we were the, I think one of the first ones who went to Visa and MasterCard and said, hey, we want to issue cars in not in one country, not in two countries. We want to issue cars in every single country on earth. And we want to do it like as a global program, um, to which <laughs> was quite a lot of fun in kind of getting them there. But you know, once we have that, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, pretty awesome. We still make mistakes. Uh, I saw a customer yesterday who told, told us that we can, we print in Singapore and then we send them to Japan, for example, our Japan issued cars and we completely, the kanji turned out to be complete gibberish on the, on the cards. <laughs> we still have struggles, but um, uh, but, but how do we, I mean, your question is, I think we are picking, uh, in choosing these fronts and we, we know that in order to build out a new feature, it's probably like four years to get to like a, a decent build out and decent adoption. Um, because we also build things globally. Uh, which makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, so we, like card program, program is a good example that, you know, build something that should work globally. And it's a lot of uh, national or domestic idiosyncrasies that we have to kind of take into account. Uh, so I, I don't know if, I think we, we're not in, we're not really keen to add more and more things and become more and more of a super app. So. So rather not, I think we'd rather like invest more in doing the things that we do, but do it really, really well for 
even more people in the countries where we operate. It's just again, the, the big stat for us is, you know, uh, Tsuna san is very um, kind, kind of mentioning how we've grown and how big we are. Uh, we're still moving about 4% of the cross-border volume for people. So 96% is still with the banks. So we clearly haven't, like the product's still not working yet. It's like, I don't know when you have product market fit by the VC standards, but <laughs> we might not be there yet. <laughs> well, clearly you do. Um, <laughs> Well, um, I want to hear a little bit about the investment in infrastructure. You know, you talked about the customer needs guided you about what to build, but I think beneath this app, there is a massive infrastructure that supports this volume that happens every day and that's growing. And that touches upon many things like the existing infrastructure that was used by banks, but also your own infrastructure working with regulators, real-time payment networks, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so I guess where your question is coming from is, I, and I kind of keep saying here that um, we do what customers want, but fundamentally, regardless of where they come from or what they do, they really want their money to move fast. So when they say, I want my money to go to, this account in Thailand, they really want it now. They want the money to be there now. So they want the money to move instantly cross-border. That's one. And the other thing, they want it to be cheap. As financial services, it's really a commodity. So it shouldn't cost you much to do simple things like payments. And the reason why they come to us often is because it's they find it much cheaper than using their bank. And the last thing is then the convenience, which can take different forms of, of what it means. And, you know, a kind of position that we've, we've figured out how to do this generally better than banks, but, but you're asking me how, so how is that, how is that possible? And um, it's a little bit of a technical answer. Uh, I guess you're all in the, uh, Finnal app, so you, you're all kind of familiar how, how banking and payments work. The, the way that banks have always made uh, cross-border transactions is, as a domestic bank, they contract different other banks around the world to kind of create a chain of payments to re uh, reach the recipients. And that often has multiple steps in it. And usually the domestic bank who's um, who has the customer, doesn't really have much control over their correspondence uh, in, outside of their country. So the, the approach that we took is we create the end-to-end -end network. So we connect to Zengen in uh, Japan as the local payment network, and we connect to, let's say, uh, faster payments network in the UK. So we know that the, both the recipient and the sender are reachable on these networks. And these re local networks are really, really reliable. So they're almost guaranteed instant all the time. And as long as we do our bit in the middle that we collect money from someone and pay out to someone, as long as we do that in a matter of seconds rather than minutes or rather than days, then the eventual transfer from the sender to recipient is gonna be instant. And the definition of instant for us is 20 seconds. So if the money leaves your bank and arrives in the recipient bank in less than 20 seconds, we call it instant. Um, and the reason why we're able to do this, and customers love it. Customers love it when they see the money's already there before the email arrives that the money's there. And, they, and the reason why we're able to do this is, is because of that infrastructure that Suna uh, is talking about. The fact that we're either directly connected into these payment networks, we've set up local gateways with banks that can get, give us reliable uh, local clearing. And we're able to do that in every place in the world and built up so that all the screening for uh, money laundering, sanctions, everything happens in like microseconds, um, well, hundreds of microseconds though, but still pretty, pretty quickly. Um, 
that's, that, that's the infrastructure. And that all comes with you know, regulatory setups. Uh, a big part of what our 5,000 people do is just to make sure that this infrastructure gets built and gets run. And how, how is the team structured just conceptually? Um, you know, the local team that understands the regulations, engineering team. I mean, at this point, your company's spanning across so many different places, but um, ha how do you do build that infrastructure? Uh, yeah, and, and I think when we, when we think of why is our, so why are we so successful? I'm kind of making the case, it's because the product is slightly better. So why is the product so much better? Why, why can't the banks do that? And I, you kind of asked me, yeah, traditionally they are, they've used this correspondent network that's maybe slightly um, aged. But the reality is, in our team, we employ 800 software engineers who build international payments. I know the large banks in, in every country have a lot of engineers, but you'll find it's probably no other institution in the world that has so many engineers dedicated to building international payments. So it's, it's, it's almost a capacity of investment that we can go into this relatively, for a bank, this is a really narrow product offering. We can invest so much behind it compared to, compared to most everyone else. So to answer your question, um, a lot of that is product engineering in addition to engineers, the designers and product managers, analysts who kind of help to make this work. Um, so a lot of operations, uh, so we serve about 10 million customers and we onboard a million every quarter. So to put million people, I asked someone yesterday, I think Kyoto is a million and a half. So sometime next year, we're gonna onboard a Kyoto in a quarter. Wow. So doing KYC on a, on a Kyoto. Everyone in Kyoto. Everyone basically. in Kyoto. Okay. Goes well, through KYC, gets a bank account. Okay, clearly you need In a to quarter. Do... Okay. <laughs> so you need some people for that. <laughs> I think in Japan, there's this my number thing, something, something, and there's a real struggle with identifying everyone. But um, yeah, I'm, a lot of technologies behind it, I think will enable it. Um, I think we only have five more minutes for this chat. So, but I wanted to touch at least this one point, which is about your focus on transparency. Um, you know, selfishly, when I try to find an investment, like I always try to think, okay, what's the one word that represents this special company? And in TransferWise or Wise's case, at least from my perspective, it's transparency. And, you know, you go on um, public record how you're keeping the promise about speed, price, and convenience, how that's evolving. And it's very transparent what you disclose but, and that's built into the way how the product functions, how you communicate internally and externally. And that's what I've learned over the years. And you don't see that very often, but just curious, um, where does that, what does it mean? And where did that come from? So it comes from really this uh, very, origi very original, remember I explained the problem where I kind of found out later what the bank like took as a, as a markup on the exchange rate. And, um, and that was quite, it was in a few different emotions. It's definitely embarrassing because I thought I was, you know, I'm not that, uh, I thought it was pretty like savvy and educated, well educated. I studied mathematics, so you know, I thought I'm good with numbers, um, but still I was kind of caught shorthanded. So I didn't, I didn't know what the bank charges me. So big deal for us is the transparency of, you know, from the very initial days, every single transfer on WISE has been converted at a, a mid-market exchange rate or some would call it a spot rate or an interbank rate. It's more or less the same thing. It's so basically, if you, call, if you convert your yen on WISE to dollars and then convert back into yen, you should get exactly the same number of yen. That's the ethos of it. And then we charge fees. For both of those conversions, we charge a fee, but we're really transparent what it costs you. And we don't model it with the, with the exchange rate. 
So that is the, I would say the kind of the biggest innovation or if there's a, if there's a legacy of like what Wise uh, leaves behind, it's I think a growing expectation in the consumer base that you, know, you don't mess with exchange rates. Like they are what they are. Uh, you should be able to look them up on Bloomberg or Reuters or Bank of Japan, and they should always be, you know, at the same time, they should be always more or less the same. Uh, and that's your value of money, and that's the fees that, that, that the bank charges. So that's the really the kind of the origin of um, origin of this transparency. But we've taken it we've taken it quite quite far. So for example, we ran a comparison because clearly a lot of people find it hard to figure out what the banks then charge. So we try to help them. We kind of reverse engineer what the banks charge in many countries and we display it as a comparison <coughs> site. Um, and guess what? Sometimes <laughs> banks or other uh, providers are cheaper than us. And then we tell our customers that you know there's someone who's cheaper to use than than wise. It happens quite rarely, but you know sometimes they have some offers on, or uh, someone someone's made a mistake in pricing, or um, so 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 that's kind of where we take transparency. And then you know in terms of internally, I just it just makes life easier. Uh, we post when we advertise for roles. We usually publish also what we're going to pay them. So then there's no discussion like that. People who don't want the job at that price shouldn't apply. Stop wasting our time. And then there's no, or there's much less like salary negotiation as well because you already applied. You know what you're going to be paid. So if you're fit for the job, let's get on with it. So that, that's how we, I think we, we do value transparency quite a lot internally um, and try to make use of it. Yeah, great, great story. And I think transparency requires courage and commitment to excellence. So I think that's um, in short supply in the world. So that's how I'm uh, very inspired by what you're doing. Uh, I think we're almost time, but maybe final question for you. I think there are uh, entrepreneurs and you know, new business managers trying to build and create new products and services for the world. Um, from Japan, any message, advice that you could share with the audience? I think the main message is start yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, it's always if you're kind of have enough time to come and listen to this lecture, <laughs> you're you're already going slightly. Too slow. I'm, I mean, I take it back. It's sometimes good to be like hear inspiring stories. I've, I've been inspired by a lot of people ahead of me, um, so that's that's, that's com completely understand. But the main thing is is kind of get on with it. Don't spend too much time fundraising. Very like good. You advice. actually want to. Yeah. You probably want to hear this as well because it's obscene how much time I see founders put into raising money rather than. Um, talking to customers to figure out what they actually Those need. VCs, right? Ye oh my gosh. Yeah, but the VCs kind of, <laughs> you hate it as well. You hate being pitched products that don't work. So yeah. you'd much, you much have good products built up yeah, and, and then, then look for investment. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I think in some ways Japan is a, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be. If, you, if you're a founder in Silicon Valley, it's very hard because there's thousands of really good founders ahead of you who are building amazing companies, have a lot of uh, backing, and are able to pay engineers huge amounts of money. Um, I think in Japan, the wave is yet to get going. So I, th I think it's a good place to be, a good place to get started. Cool. Well, with that, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the audience.